I'm Adam Trombley. <laughs> and uh, I um, invented in 1980 a machine that we called the Closed Path Home Polar Generator. And the Closed Path Home Polar Generator um, basically was uh, designed to maximize the amount of magnetic flux in a rotating flywheel. And um, we now are sitting eight years later, and as a result of the very good work of uh, Dr. Tuari over here, we have um, uh, now had bona fide third-party contribution and confirmation of the anomaly, which, uh, as uh, everybody watching this will probably know, uh, Bruce De Palma from Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, made an in generator at Sunburst Farms in the late 70s, 1979, 1978. And um, the anomaly that we see is uh, that, uh, and we believe we're just beginning to scratch the surface, I would add, we are beginning to see that we can take energy from vacuum space itself. We can bring this energy out of vacuum space and into reality because vacuum space is biasable. It is polarizable in terms of density. And in other words, you can polarize vacuum space in such, such a way that you can create a stress. And um, Pramahansa Tuari has done, I'm sure, the most thorough theoretical development of this concept uh, that I've seen. And uh, I, th I think it would be uh, more appropriate for us when we open up the discussion later on to go into that. I'm Bruce De Palma. Uh, I live in Santa Barbara. Uh, I guess I'm responsible for the end machine. And uh, I'm an MIT graduate and uh, electrical engineer and a physicist. And 10 years ago, I made the first experiments in Santa Barbara with the end machine, constructed by the Sunburst community. And Adam Trombley came to visit me and I showed him the operation of the machine. And that started him on thinking about his idea of closing the flux path through, through a method of taking the flux around the internal rotating disk, which has been taken up around the world, uh, because it is a very um, simple, easy to realize system for producing the anomalous effect, the end machine effect uh, that we have. and so. Although my work has been on machines which don't have a closed magnetic path, other workers have all taken up the Trombley machine because of its simplicity of construction. And uh, Paramahamsa Tiwari has been one of the principal men in this effort. And he and I have corresponded for 10 years. And some third-party physicist who I can't remember wrote to me in 1978 and said I should send my work to him. And uh, it fitted in with his space vortex theory, which he had been developing concurrently. And this is a good illustration of how great scientific events happen simultaneously around the world in the minds of many men. So I can't, and I don't think I should say too much more at this moment, at this introductory stage, but Paratuma Hamsatori, have a few words yourself here. I am P. Tiwari from India. I am presently working as a chief project engineer at a nuclear power project, Kaiga Atomic Power Project. About 72 or 73 was the period when I had been um, wishing to look into the structure of electron so as to develop a theory such that the charge effect of electron could be explained by circulation of vacuum. It took me a few years to write down some fundamental formulation and by the time the relationships of this basic theory, space vortex theories, the theory was uh, almost coming to an end. Bruce De Palma from USA sent me a letter somewhere around 
77 or 78 may and there you know, he very boldly um, tried to put forth an experimental fact of his telling that uh, he has been able to prove that electrical output from a rotating magnet can exceed the mechanical energy required to rotate that system. Uh, what in fact uh, he had proved was something very, very astonishing and especially for an electrical engineer that I am. And my first reaction was one of uh, immediate uh, disbelief and it took me a fortnight uh, of thinking as to whether such a thing is ever possible. Because uh, fundamentally I had been a very, very uh, probing kind of engineer on issues of electrical technology and had been thinking on electric current, voltage and flux and the interactions, etc. since quite some time. Now, after a fortnight, it occurred to me that if at all there is a sense and meaning in the space water theory that I have developed, then I must put forth and use these equations and start seeing as to whether they fit at all with the experimental results that De Palma had sent. And thereafter, I took it seriously and started seeing quite a bit of a meaning. And with small magnets, I first try to ensure that the voltage is there or not and thereafter uh, some more experiments I carried out try to, trying to prove uh, De Palma's, uh, trying to check rather De Palma's uh, experimental results. Now a series of correspondence between him and me, uh, myself trying to put forth the postulates and the details of my theory and he trying to put forth the theoretical background that he has as an, as an engineer and the lecturer and all that. It went on till um, I got uh, from Bruce some beautiful literature uh, giving uh, indeed very sophisticated details on the machine manufacture and uh, uh, test results which um, Tromley, Adam Tromley and his uh, assistant Khan, K-A-H-N, perhaps Khan, uh, sure. they, they had done and I was indeed astonished uh, seeing the um, engineering design of that whole thing, the details and all that. And with further queries uh, I could get from Bruce that uh, what were the amperes and what was the output and the whole entire thing impressed me. And then I took it up a bit seriously and at a nuclear power station at its laboratory where appropriate testing um, equipment are available. I tried to make a very thorough uh, checks on quite a few models, uh, just trying to prove the incremental power ratio, uh, just trying to check whether the incremental power ratio is indeed more than unity, rather than trying to make any substituted machine at that time. And that's how I got convinced that the invention of uh, De Palma and development of Trombley, uh, they were indeed something very, very historical events which just do not take place every day, perhaps centuries uh, pass before we do come across uh, some such inventions. Um, it is after that that I tried to put forth the equations of the space vortex theory with the various results and since they fitted in I was only too glad to see the proof to the theory um, through these experiments of uh, De Palma and Trombley and I must say that at the time when I had got the letter from Bruce I was in fact very, very anxious and I wished if some physicist could suggest to me whether there could be a proof at all for proving a space vortex theory. To detect a space and vacuum was becoming such a big problem. So it appears as if it was destined that Bruce was to write to me and I was to get results of uh, uh, Adam. Uh, I now, uh, not telling much, I only wish that uh, we find ways and means and we really take this task um, very, very seriously as if it's really uh, the cause for humanity, for the world betterment because uh, always when some big events have taken place like that, um, those who have invented it, 
those who have been responsible for its discovery have indeed uh, got to go through very very difficult task that's the test perhaps it's the testing period for uh, Bruce and uh, Trombley and for me too well at this moment I would wonder if we could discuss a little bit about the scope of history for for 10 years 10 years ago this was initially brought out and this is something that initially was investigated and in, in that period of 10 years we've had a number of things with the American government with the development of new technology and now finally with the building of a large-scale machine that demonstrates this principle where do you see this going in the next 10 years in the next 10 years 10 years is a long time at this point um, Buckminster Fuller used to say that every new technology had a period of gestation that was primarily dictated by the amount of intellectual inertia that was present in the priest class of the scientific establishment at this point. And I think that where we are headed with this thing is that now that there is critical proof of the anomaly that has appeared, um, I think what is happening is that that inertia, that moment of inertia, has ceased to be so ponderous and that at this point we are beginning to develop a momentum towards uh, worldwide development. Uh, many people are doing experiments, many people are uh, attempting to see and are seeing as a result of their experiments the fact that this anomaly does exist. Uh, really Pramahasatori burst the bubble in terms of the world literature uh, by publishing his uh, paper and uh, I think that I think that where we're headed is that within 10 years we, we must see uh, the development of these technologies, this new class of technologies, um, because we can't afford not to see that. And I think that in order for this to be truly accomplished, a lot of education has to go on. Um, I know Bruce lectures a lot, I lecture a lot. Uh, I've been from UCLA to Johns Hopkins this year and uh, I can say that um, there is a much higher degree of acceptability as a result of the bona fide third party confirmation that uh, Pramasatwari has provided and been courageous enough to publish because uh, uh, many scientists of stature uh, simply would shy away from such a challenge. I think that um, we can see that uh, the fact in our country that uh, both Bruce and I are sitting here uh, still in a relatively impecunious state is an indi indication of the kind of inertia that we've been confronted by in this country, which I know uh, Pramahasatwari has even commented on coming to the United States and being surprised by the amount of inertia that uh, we, have we have encountered here. I think that within 10 years we will see commercial development going on on a broad scale. I think we're, we're going to see a lot of different permutations of the technology. I think we're going to see that. I think we're going to see that the the fundamental concept behind the technology is going to itself encourage the development of new classes of these technologies. And I think that um, in the next 20 years, we will see worldwide implementation. I think that in the meantime, the American people need to know, and not just the American people, but the world public needs to know that uh, we have no choice because uh, we really can't go any further uh, in our contamination of the earth. We can't go any further in our destruction of the planet. Maybe you should uh, tell the audience about your work with Project Earth and your studies of the atmosphere and the ozone depletion and how this... I spoke to you earlier tonight mm -hmm. about the cover-up about the ozone depletion also coincides with the cover-up oh, sure. of the end machine. Yeah. Well, and, I think... And, you know, yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, I think that a lot of things that is very difficult for people to understand is people hear that something like this has been confirmed and they say, well, if it's been confirmed, why haven't I heard about it? And I think that uh, at one time I was um, naive in that extreme that I would have asked the same question. What we really have on our hands at this moment is an economy worldwide which has been based, especially in the Western cultures, on fossil fuels. It's been based on the fossil fuel consumption. Um, it is a highly destructive practice that in 1906 Nikola Tesla warned us would one day poison the atmosphere of the entire Earth. 
poison in the atmosphere is something that we are all more or less familiar with. It's become almost, uh, we're almost blasé about it. The fact of the matter is that in looking into this carefully, starting out in late 1983 with encouragement from several different sources, um, we began, I began to do research to establish and quantify the, the degree to which the environment of the Earth on a global scale had been impacted by the fossil fuel economy. And in the process, what has been uncovered is that we have been consuming a tremendous amount of oxygen with fossil fuels. We have been consuming uh, force at an alarming rate, 64% of the ground cover in Africa, the photosynthesizing biomass in the African continent has been destroyed in the last 20 years alone. Uh, if you consider the ramifications of that, what we really are faced with is a very, very, very serious proposition. If we continue this destruction of the biomass, we are going to undermine on a global level, and we already have severely impacted on a global level, the hydrologic cycle, and we're going to begin to see drought in areas where we have never seen drought before. The monsoons in India will be dramatically affected on a, on a repeat basis. In other words, this is not something that's just going to happen one time and be kind of an episode that occurs only once. The current drought in the United States of America, which some people simplistically attribute to the greenhouse effect, is actually a more complex process of the interaction of dust that actually comes and eight and nine million square kilometer clouds, which has been confirmed photographically by NASA and the Soviet space program, um, across the Atlantic Ocean, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and this is, of course, dramatically altering our weather, and this is not the appropriate forum to elaborate on that altogether. We have, in South America and Central America, another 29 to 33 percent of the ground cover that has already been destroyed. And this is dramatically affecting fisheries, uh, the coral populations, not just in the Caribbean area, but throughout the entire Pacific Rim, the phytoplankton populations, the phytoplankton are the base of the entire oceanic food chain and produce half of the oxygen on the planet. Uh, we have seen severe global impact, and it is not at all insignificant. Uh, to draw attention to this has been a rather difficult task because in 1984, for example, well-known scientists of reputation in this country in positions at the National Center of Atmospheric Research and other institutions denied, uh, rather chronically, that there was really that big of a problem. They were basically implying that the Earth was large enough to absorb almost any amount of insult that we heaped upon her. And I think that that attitude obviously now in 1988 has changed, but the process of, of having that information actually be disseminated into the public has been an extraordinary experience for me because I felt in 1983-84, for example, that people would want to know that we were facing serious depletion in the stratospheric ozone. There had been a theory put forward in 1974 that suggested that this would be the case as a result of the impact of chlorofluorocarbons. But by 1984, basically, it was considered a moot point in this country. Nobody was considering that theory anymore to be an actual valid theory. And Instead, what I said was, where does the O3, which is ozone, in the stratosphere come from? It comes from the O2, which rises up from the photosynthesizing biomass on the Earth's surface in the biosphere. And if you are consuming a tremendous amount of oxygen from fossil fuel, combustion, and if you are at the same time destroying vast areas of forest and impacting the phytoplankton populations by cutting off their nutrients from organic runoff from continents, then you have a reduced oxygen tension that begins to appear in the troposphere. Now, many scientists came back and said, well, even if you consumed all of the carbon on Earth, if you consumed all of it, that it wouldn't have a very serious impact on oxygen tension. Some people said the maximum was 25% reduction of oxygen. Other people said that it was as high as 40 percent. This is very interesting, Adam. Uh, the process you're describing is one where we're simultaneously burning up all the oxygen in the air and at the same time reducing the ability of the oxygen in the air to renew itself through photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Exactly. And the point I 
wanted to bring out was that this is such a terrible crisis that the solution to the crisis would probably appear in the minds of many men simultaneously. Yep. And that's the phenomenon of the end machine, and that's why we're three of us sitting here. But basically the same attitude of cover-up is operating in the area of this ecological crisis as is operating in the area of the people in this country which are presently making the end machine for military purposes and not telling us about it either. Well, you see, the, the main issue here is, is exactly that in the sense that the same economy is impacted negatively, whether you're talking about the generation of energy from space or you're talking about uh, ozone depletion because this economy is the, the econ this economy is the economy of of, the of, of fossil fuels. Oh, okay, all right. And 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 so if you have instead of gold, because you know when the gold standard was eliminated, fossil fuels really became the standard, the always fluctuating standard of the world economy, and uh, the extraordinary amount of money that exchanges hands on a daily basis is almost unfathomable if if you really sit down and look at it. If you really sit down and look at the net cost, for example, of, of a barrel of oil right now from the Arabian area, uh, a friend of mine at uh, ESOP Institute relatively recently did a calculation that every barrel of oil, if you include defense costs from this country, costs $143. And most people don't even begin to realize that. And um, But getting back to the environmental issue, and the environmental question is, something that I think I wanted just to complete a couple of the pictures that I started to elaborate on. The, the ground up column that rises up from the biosphere rises up through the troposphere and into the stratosphere. And it is a mixture of gases that rises up all the time and then photoreacts with solar radiation in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum to create ozone. However, if you change that mixture of gases, then what happens is that once this mixture of gases reaches the stratosphere, instead of producing ozone, it produces all kinds of other things. Chlorofluorocarbons have an impact, but there are many other gases that we now know are reaching the stratosphere, which also have a very negative impact on not just ozone production, but the tension or the density of the ozone in that area surrounding our globe. We know right now from data gathered from the Nimbus satellite, which is the United States NASA satellite, designed specifically to take 256,000 measurements an hour to measure ozone in the stratosphere. That, and if we are to believe that data, uh, which some people question, we have anywhere from an 8 to 9 percent depletion since the 1960 baseline. Um, NASA. Uh, I have to say, was not real enthusiastic about releasing this information to the public and attempted to claim at the end of 1987 that the Nimbus satellite was so severely out of calibration that there couldn't be more than a 0.5% global ozone depletion. Some of us who knew better uh, raised Kane on the phone and with congressmen and senators, their science advisors, and said, we cannot allow the American public to be so deluded and to be lied to any longer because every man, woman, and child, every animal, every tree, every plant is affected. All life has evolved on this planet over hundreds of millions of years and adapted itself to a certain level of ultraviolet influx. And now that ultraviolet influx has been greatly increased. By March 11th, 1988, NASA had changed its position dramatically, citing information gathered from 100 stations around the world in a joint United Nations NASA program. They said, yes, indeed, there is a much more severe reduction in stratospheric ozone globally than we anticipated, as if it was a surprise. It's interesting to note retrospectively that the British actually discovered the hole in the ozone over, over Antarctica in 1977, whereas NASA claimed to discover, quote unquote, the hole in 1985, because they had the program which interpreted the data from the Nimbus satellite reject any data coming from the Nimbus satellite that indicated depletions greater than 3% in the stratospheric ozone 
and it rejected that information and filed it in a file called Noise. One would think that you would become rather suspicious when you had millions and billions of data bits and data bytes of noise. And the percentage of noise was rising dramatically relative to the percentage of good data. The first assumption, of course, was that the Nimbus satellite must be out of calibration. This was also true in 1985, that NASA tried to rationalize internally that it must be out of calibration. This is extremely important for people to understand because the measurements done by Nimbus, as I said, 256,000 measurements an hour as the Nimbus satellite rotates or orbits rather around the Earth, these measurements are done in a, in a manner that provides extremely high resolution visual data. In other words, you can observe this on a CRT screen on a data terminal and you can see the hole over Antarctica. In September of 1987, the data from the Nimbus satellite was in extraordinarily close agreement with ground measurements in Antarctica. And yet, as I said, on December 30th of 1987, NASA claimed that this data was irrelevant and was no longer important. Who, what kind of people we have to ask ourselves would intentionally try to suppress such information? We have to wonder as human beings what possible motivation there could be. A little hint of that motivation leaked out through a New York Times interview that followed upon the outrage that echoed throughout the world scientific community when the Reagan administration produced its acid rain report in 1987. And that outrage was voiced by the, by the Minister of the Environment in Canada, for example, who called the report voodoo science. Um, certain individuals at the Max Planck Institute in Germany said that it was an embarrassment to all the American scientific community that such a report, which claimed, by the way, that acid rain was not a problem anywhere in this country, which is an utter lie, um, they, people were just flabbergasted by this. When a reporter from the New York Times called the National Center of Atmospheric Research, a scientist there, a senior scientist, one of the program heads said to this reporter, you don't understand the kind of pressure we are under not to criticize the report. People's careers are in jeopardy. One wonders if we are not hearing an echo of the same type of rationale that must have gone through the minds of people at Auschwitz because what we face as a result of this unprecedented irresponsibility is an environmental Auschwitz, is an environmental situation which could literally lead to the decimation of the human race. I don't personally believe that's going to occur because I believe there's greater forces at work in the universe than governments and greater forces involved than the intellectual stagnation that has tended to characterize people who are trying to save face in the scientific community. Not all scientists are so biased. Greater and greater numbers of scientists are beginning to either suffer from chronic embarrassment to the point where they're changing their action or have already changed their action and decided to live a different way. And I personally feel that it is a great moment, and I don't want to get too, um, use too many superlatives here, but I feel it's a great moment in history right now that uh, Tuari and De Palma and Trombley can be sitting in this room in a convivial manner, um, having the good news to bring to the human race together, that um, there is actually a solution to this. There is actually something that is hopeful, but we have to absolutely move now. We don't have time. We can't wait 20 years to begin to implement this technology. We simply don't have time for that. And I don't want to, um, you know, I think, I think that uh, I can't emphasize enough that uh, this isn't something that we can be blasé about. I think we have to unify on a global scale in a way that has never occurred historically before this time. Uh, we have to be allied in the struggle to restore the earth, which we have been so extraordinarily irresponsible with. And uh, it's my prayer, uh, my heartfelt prayer, 
that uh, human beings all over this planet will wake up not only to the crisis, but to the reality of the solution. And uh, always remember that a leak in a dam starts with a small crack, but after the water starts flowing through that crack, it, it expands very rapidly, and we have a bursting of the dam. And I feel like right now we're on the brink of the bursting of the dam. And uh, I'm just grateful that we're all still sitting here in this room and uh, able to talk about it. <laughs> Uh, you see, I am very, very optimistic about this whole development. In fact, extremely optimistic for two reasons. One is, the day I myself tested this young generator and saw the effect, I felt that electrical engineers have been foolish in the last 150 years and the entire development of the generators has taken a wrong track. Rather than rotating the stator and rotor together and designing a system without any relative, relative motion between the conductor and magnet, having believed that power can come out only when there is a relative motion, despite the fact that Faraday had discovered that, we have simply slept. The electrical engineers, the industries, if they are not waking up today, it is because of the greatest embarrassment they have had. It is just like that you take a bucket of water from here and then pour it on the floor and again pick it up and pour it and during that process drink a cup here and drink a cup here, it is falling. That's all that you have been doing. You generate power from stream, uh, give it to the generator and when it comes out, push it through the armature in such a silly circuit that it causes drag and it starts drawing the equal amount of power. So it's a wrong development. And since it is a wrong development, the day one small end generator is built, the industrialists, greedy as they are, they will immediately rush to that. And as you say, a small leak and a big uh, dam, that's what is going to happen. Fortunately, the expenditure for building a set of 5 kilowatt or 10 kilowatt for demonstration, considering India and the work there is not much. And knowing very well, in fact, the main contributors, uh, De Palma and Trumley of America, and my full uh, wholehearted uh, ideas that it is uh, these engineers who have to be uh, brought to light for the invention, I'm going to put my best effort and I don't think it's going to be more than a year. If necessary, I'll just make a machine and send it to India, send it all over to show what is happening. That has got to be done. Because the pollution, pollution as you very rightly said, is indeed taking place for a country as vast as America, if there are acid rains and things like that, you understand what all is happening. Despite the fact that almost two-thirds of this globe has only ocean and we have no access in that area, yet with the limited one-third or one-fourth, I don't know how much it is, earth, and much of it is even desert, we have tried to pollute to that extent that shows the entirely wrong development of the system for generation of power. I don't think coal was intend, in, 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 uh, intended to go on burning and making an inefficient generator and go on producing power. Absolutely. What perhaps was intended was to have these uh, uh, self-generating system which we have now discovered and one-tenth or maybe one-hundredth of the coal power only will be needed to rotate it and to take the power out of it. So there is a, um, uh, you see, uh, no one comes to your help when you invent a thing. It is you who has to carry that. No one will come and finance you unless you have financed yourself and brought it down. And, and showed, it, showed it to the world, you know, something like that. That's what happens. But there are un invisible forces working. They come, they make you invent, they bring the sources, some contacts you get. And for all that, what is needed is a great optimism. I can see with very, very clear uh, uh, conviction that this invention has come out basically because there, uh, we are almost reaching the end of pollution. 
and it had to come out. It has fortunately come out. So um, I think uh, that is one reason that we have taken a wrong track and the second reason is that uh, um, resources like coal, oil, there is a limitation. Just because we are unable to perceive, imagine the next thousand years because we die in less than hundred years. Just, just I can't imagine two million rupees but I can imagine ten dollars. It is that lack of complete foresight of the human being that makes him believe that he will use coal as the energy and coal will last. Coal will not last uh, a century, oil will not last a century. We know daily you are not getting it. Hence, if we have known that this is a new source of energy, in fact the world over people should have had a commotion and they would have rushed for this, but they have not because of silly direction that technology had taken and how can they accept openly their foolishness. So these professors, these technologists having gone in a wrong track are simply just keeping quiet, trying to find out a pretext by which they can say, oh yes, 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 power is greater than unity. That is what is happening in the professors. That's right. They all keep quiet. Yeah. They are highly embarrassed. And as far as the industries are concerned, they will lose their business. Because the kind of generator that they are making, you know, putting so much of insulation and all that mm, uh, silly thing, everything will disappear with this uh, uh, N, N generator principles. So I'm very, very optimistic. And uh, there is a kind of a struggle. I have very fortunately placed in a, con in a position today when small sets like that can always be made, can always be uh, developed and can always be demonstrated. And uh, I think uh, our optimism itself uh, will bring uh, everything to fruition. I'm very, very convinced. I think, that, I think that the stranglehold that the power grid has had on the world population which has allowed energy resources to be controlled by a very small minority of people for the sake of their own profit. We're entering into an epoch where when people begin to realize that space itself is charged with an unimaginable amount of energy, um, we're going to see that uh, people are going to realize that this, this is implicitly already equally distributed. And um, it's, going to, it's going to have a, a change on the sociological paradigms that have characterized human culture up to this point. Uh, all kinds of provinciality exists in human culture, as we know, and, uh, and this, is, this is the end of it. So we're, we're talking about vast philosophical, uh, even religious changes occurring on the planet. I think one of the interesting things was that this thing was initially confirmed in terms of outside of this country, uh, in India, where um, your own cosmology uh, was not so inimical to the concept of an unencapsulated form of existence. That's exactly so, and I might also point out that it was the Indian Vedanta and the philosophy of God which trained my mind Yep. to the point where I could conceive of such a thing. Yep. So the connection is sort of like I'm repaying a debt. Amen. I'm repaying a debt for what India has given me in Absolutely. terms of the way my mind works and the ancient philosophies of self-understanding and thought uh, have been developed there for thousands of years. Absolutely. And they're available and have been available all the time. And as a scientist examining all the possibilities for the future, as I did when I began this project in 1970, I could see that there was no solution in the science that we knew. There was no solution. And I was agreed with by the Council of Rome, by all the big scientists, yes, 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 we're going to run out of oil, we're going to run out of uranium, the world is becoming polluted. And suddenly, all has become quiet, you see. But I didn't become quiet because I really understood this was the truth. And I really feel that the invention of a machine like this, which is going to be of central importance to the development of our future world, has to exist in our mind. Your mind, my mind, his mind. And when we feel the need strongly enough, when we feel the need strongly enough, and this is a need that is of reflection of the sensitivity to the pain and agony of the individuals on this planet that can't understand science, 
don't know anything about money are completely subject to the whims of the weather and industrialists and developers and things like that. The agony of all these people is not answered, but I feel it. And I felt it all through this. And for some reason that I can't understand, I tune into this feeling. And so I feel that it's a sin, it's a crime of high order in, the, in a world which is being contracted in its resources by their consumption in a feedback arrangement where we're not only using up the oxygen but using up the means of generating the oxygen. This is a very swift process. The fact that governments and mindsets prevent a solution to this technological problem from happening because of military reasons or reasons of greed I think is one of the great tragedies of our society and the fact that we tolerate this in our society only speaks to the low level of morality that we've sunk to in our pursuit of money and power and military positions and everything else like that. So job security. job security, but as I said before, the first course they ought to put in college is what happens when you lose your job, so you'll be prepared. Anyway. <laughs> so <clears throat> what happens when you lose your environment? Well, right, and so <laughs> this this has its humorous sides, but we, we're so into our self gratification and selfishness of our job and our home and our family. We don't think about the other people in the world that have no control of their homes or where they live or the job they have. And this is a great pain for me. And that is the reason that drove me to this. And it's what's propelled me all through the years to keep it up. <laughs> and There's one thing that I have observed in the leaders of De Palma right since his uh, 1977 letter or 78 letter that he has indeed maintained a sense of dignity and what all he has been talking that it's for the benefit of the world and things like that and it is now almost a decade. Now I wish I had some correspondence from Adam also but sure I have met him and I uh, have seen him and I have seen I know him now. You see since both of you engineers have invented something very, very big and something very, very important. It's just not an advice for me, but I feel that your reactions to the public who is uh, not giving a hand to you or who is criticizing you or your letters and your writing should be as lofty as the very in, of invention of yours is. Well, I have the um, letters from um, De Palma and I, I know Adam. I'm sure they will do it. This is essential because this even historical event shall be quoted. Not only today, but even yesterday what it did or tomorrow what he will do. In the decades to come, I'm so much convinced on it. So that is one. And second thing, that uh, if we maintain that image of ours, behavior of ours, uh, writing letters to the people and don't show too much of a reaction if the public doesn't um, come forth and do. Uh, perhaps the um, uh, entire things may, may come to our favor. It is not that they have invented some small fractional horsepower motor and things like that. It is such a big thing that people will come running down. Perhaps the time has to come. Yeah, I agree with you I, totally. I agree with you too. I think that I think one of the things that I know that has characterized my experience, and I'm sure Bruce can concur with this, because I know that uh, um, from conversations we've had for nearly a decade now, that uh, this is something that is a part and parcel of, of both of our experiences. Is that when you run into this inertia, you run into the resistance. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of frustration, and it tends to. Um, to a certain degree or other, alter your perception of the world. And I think that your point is well taken because we can't afford any of us to allow the inertia to dictate our subjective yeah, state. Because, because let me tell you, people in India, about your names, uh, engineers and students, they write letters to me, sir, will you please give me the address? They write to me too. And yeah. Bruce Gibson, Adam never sends me a letter. 
Now you demand me. At least give me post it because people are asking me. And I take that old, uh, you know, my you paper and go on <laughs> things like that. He has not sent me even one letter. So by going asking him sometimes, you see, you people are regarded so high. Your names are so well known, uh, at least among the engineers and among philosophers and and. Uh, Yeah, of course, I go on telling them, telling them to brilliant engineers and <laughs> scientists from the USA. So sure what you are, therefore, you know, uh, that's what it is. So <laughs> we should keep in touch. All I mean is, I agree with that. Yes. Well, I think that's totally correct. Yeah. It's it's a process of refinement of the spirit. I've always felt that the way to understand the situation and not react against it is to understand that sooner or later all three of us will probably be in positions of great power yes. and that unless we carry that with humility and sensitivity we were not suited for the job Absolutely. and that this period of trial is to ensure that once we attain that which we have strived for so long we won't abuse that situation because we are trying to speak to the people. We never want to separate ourselves from the people of this yes. planet. We never want to feel that we're elevated. I want to be as good a scientist as I can be, but if a man sweeps the carpets, I have enough respect for him to know that he's the best carpet sweeper he can be. And that's the way all of us should propel ourselves through this life. So I feel that although there were times when I was kind of angry about some things, this is my spiritual refinement to endure this period of 20 years, two decades for me, 10 years for these men. We've been through a lot of uh, experiences, but I do feel in the same sense that that Paramount Satori feels and Adam Trombley feels that we are right at the point where this is going to break into the self-sustained mode. And that means we're known, we're accepted, and it's the goal we've sought for so long is going to happen, not only for us, but for the world. So I'm very hopeful and I'm very grateful that we were allowed the, allowed the few hours we've had together for people that have come from the other side of the globe. This is a magnificent event where two people on opposite sides of the planet, one with an experiment, the other with a theory, came together and the two fit together like the pieces of some grand puzzle And the result of that has been a revolution which is going to transform the planet. And if there's, any, if there's anything that can be learned from this, it's the magnificence and greatness of what's going on. Because what is happening is a planetary event. This is not confined to India or the United States. This is a worldwide happening. It's propelled by a worldwide consciousness of hunger. It's propelled by a worldwide consciousness of the pollution. It's a worldwide consciousness of the limitation of resources. And it's a worldwide response from scientists in every country on this planet. The very best that the human race can produce have taken up this idea and are carrying it on. So I can't believe that this is going to come to naught. It's going to be a very magnificent, wonderful epoch that is going to result from this. And it's my hope that we are mature enough citizens to make use of this freedom in the most constructive, creative way possible. I, I agree. I think that 10 years from now, we'll probably look at, back at this time and we will have seen the most rapid transition. I anticipate that we'll see as rapid a transition as we saw in the semiconductor industry, at least. How about the, the, the television industry? Yeah, the television When industry, they, the right, same thing. You we, know. Because we have, we have this vast international communications network now that carries... Uh, all forms of communication and I think that this is going to cause for rapid proliferation of this technology. When I was in Germany, uh, I found myself in the position of a person that had studied, studied electromagnetic theory in my college days, both from the engineer's side and from the physicist's side. And I had, at that time, been intimidated by Maxwell's equations and, you know. And over the years, having worked with these machines for so long now, for the last 20 years, and having built so many and having written so many letters, I find myself as an expert on electromagnetic theory, something that I never would have imagined had 
based on my former feelings. Not only an expert, but uh, that's the call you coming. Not only an expert, but um, hold on a second. Let me get to Yeah, let's put it over there. When you a generator, you make core, you make conductor of mild steel, wrought iron, whatever you're mm -hmm. using. Magnetic iron. Yeah. Magnetic iron. And just above that, put some insulation. Not the air gap, air gap need not be there, put some insulation. And rigidly fixed on that, the magnetic circuit. So that, that magnetic circuit creates magnetic field and it directly goes to the conductor. Mm -hmm. And both are rigidly connected. Mm -hmm. So instead of the disk radius, what you are getting the voltage depending upon this length only this much, you are changing the axis. So you are having L this length now. Mm -hmm. And flux here is like this as a non-conventional thing. And this rotates, you are going to get voltage along this length. You are rotating generator stator together. Now put another conductor below with the magnetic field up. Just as we do in conventional thing, you know, north and then south. Or uh, north itself. I mean, you put it in such a way that it is opposite. Mm -hmm. and tie them up the end windings like a conventional generator. It sounds too easy. <laughs> I well, don't know. Uh, you are right, you are right, but then I believe, Bruce, you will write to me, I am 100% sure, <laughs> that it is giving 220 volts. <laughs> I, I, have, I, have to, I have to think this one through. Yes, I, I know, that's why I am giving you the problem. And let me tell you, I asked one engineer to make a start, that fellow got confused. Mm -hmm. So I told him, leave it now. <laughs> so, I, you see, all that we are doing is, we are changing the length and you want magnetic field and that length you to move to No, I understand it. I, I just wonder whether, so, you see, um, this, there's not, this is not a situation where we understand everything about it. Yes, very true, very true. And that there may yet be some surprises yes. in, yeah, yes. in, in this. And yeah. so I just cannot, yeah, I've, had, I agree. I, I've, I've been through this too much for me to, to, me, to uh, to have anything, but I'll, I'm taking it in, and it's going through my brain, and I'm thinking about it. Yes. But returning to the earlier uh, discussion, when I was in Germany, here I found myself in front of a room full of physics professors, and a room full of PhDs in various things. And here I was talking about electromagnetic theory, the thing that I never felt that I had too much uh, cognizance of. And I think what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is for a student to grow up into a man and then for a student to grow up, to grow up and become a man and then go back and tell the same professors that were talking to him about something new is, uh, well, when it was happening, I really, I, you know, and they were interested and they wanted to know. This is, this is a tremendous... Uh, uh, change. Mm -hmm. And I was strong enough in my convictions and certain enough about my results mm -hmm. that I could speak to these people about the very basic factors in electromagnetic theory mm -hmm. and how I understood them and inertia and gravitation and subjects which were hardly breathed about. Yep. Or what, no one would ever think of challenging Einstein or Wheeler or these interpretations. Right. See, but here we are. We've gotten strong enough to take it on. Mm -hmm. And that too. It's amazing. That's an amazing thing. It really is an amazing thing. I was considering that because a lot of the ways that I approached this initially was from the point of view of astrophysics and, and phenomena such as the fact that Jupiter produces multiples of the energy that it is supposedly receiving from the Sun, only to discover um, that uh, flyby mission um, confirmed uh, in the 70s that we had this tremendous electrical current coming out of the equatorial region of Jupiter looping through the moon Eo and looping back into Jupiter. And the article was, was uh, produced by some Goddard uh, Space Flight Center people from NASA who said, uh, uh, guess what, Jupiter's a home polar generator. But then uh, they were trying to suggest that the relative motion between uh, the moon Eo and Jupiter was actually what caused this effect. And they, when, you, when you did a very simple calculation of it, you found that that couldn't possibly be the case. So then uh, there was a second paper that suggested something else about Jupiter, but these phenomena uh, characterize the way the universe works. And it's not just uh, 
uh, our view of electrical generation that's been corrupt. It's our view of planetary electrodynamics and stellar electrodynamics and, and how the universe works in general and even down to the very atom now, of course, and the electron, um, which uh, uh, is one of now, the most interesting things that man has ever discovered. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's now, uh, these people who, uh, I, when I was first in Germany in 1980, uh, somebody, somebody came up from the Frankfurt Institute and he said, uh, uh, the electrons were like soldiers uh, that marched around this loop circuit and uh, they shot their guns and then they came back for ammo. But this is, this is literally the way this man saw the universe. And it was reflected in the way he designed and taught he designed his generators on the basis of a certain kind of conception of the mindset, universe, yeah. certain mindset. And I think that uh, one of the things that in lecturing in the, in the last few years that I've seen too, where it's just like, uh, it is remarkable to be standing in those institutions like the University of Colorado or Johns Hopkins or UCLA and, and standing there and telling the professors right. or telling the people there that the fundamental concept of the universe has been incorrect. The fundamental concept of the electron has been incorrect, but not saying, you know, like a child or an adolescent, you know, you're bad because you were wrong, just saying, well, now we have to throw away the garbage. Science at MIT, and he has degrees in electrical engineering, engineering and physics. Um, he's done a lot of government research and development work. He's uh, also gone to the Graduate School of Applied Physics at Harvard. He worked at Polaroid in their research department in Cambridge, Massachusetts, from 1962 through 1970. He's uh, done a lot of lecturing on photographic science concurrently. And he's uh, done a lot of work at MIT Department of Electrical Engineering in the laboratory of Harold Edgerton. Um, in 1970, he began uh, the studies of uh, some of this stuff, and the invention of the end machine came in 1977. Uh, this year, he formed his own company to uh, manufacture the end machine power generation systems. So I want to welcome Bruce De Palma. I am very happy to be able to talk about the end machine because I think the end machine is finally reaching a point where enough people in the world have duplicated it and discovered its properties that people are beginning to seriously think that something good might be happening. Uh, to start, I would like to thank the Tesla Society for inviting me and I think it's a good idea to sort of invoke the spirit of Nikola Tesla to the extent that we can. And so I brought a, a copy of a paper which Tesla delivered in 1891. And it was published in the Electrical Engineer in New York, September 2nd, 1891. And this represents the state of our knowledge of the unipolar dynamo. It's a, it's a paragraph out of notes on the unipolar dynamo by Nikola Tesla. And it goes, <clears throat> It is characteristic of fundamental discoveries, of great achievements of intellect, that they retain an undiminished power upon the imagination of the thinker. The memorable experiment of Faraday, with the disc rotating between the two poles of the magnet, which has borne such magnificent fruit, has long passed into everyday existence. Yet, there are certain features about this embryo of the present dynamos and motors, which even today appear to us striking, and are worthy of the most careful Study. Consider, for example, the case of a disc of iron or other metal revolving between the two opposite poles of the magnet, and the polar surface is completely covering both sides of the disc, and assume the current to be taken off or conveyed to the same by contacts uniformly from all points of the periphery of the disc. Take first the case of a motor. In all ordinary motors, operation is dependent upon some shifting or change of the result of the, of the magnetic attraction exerted upon the armature. This process being affected either by some mechanical contrivance on the motor or by the action of currents of the proper character. 
We may explain the operation of such a motor just as we can out of a water wheel, but in the above example of the disk surrounded completely by the polar surfaces, there is no shifting of the magnetic action. No change whatever, as far as we know, and yet rotation ensues. Here then, ordinary considerations do not apply. We cannot even give a superficial explanation as in ordinary motors, and the operation will be clear to us only when we have recognized the very nature of the forces involved and fathomed the mystery of the invisible connecting mechanism. So this sets the tone of the state of our knowledge of the Faraday disk, the homopolar generator, the end machine, things like that. But long before I ever thought about end machines and electrical generators, I studied rotation. And to start off, let's have the first slide here. And we go on that. I guess I'm the one that presses the button. Okay. Go back. It doesn't go back. You gotta reverse it on the machine. Okay, reverse it back. Okay, this is a machine called a force machine. And it's a machine for studying forces. Now, in physics, we have many physical theories, uh, which we use, like Einstein's theories, the theories of thermodynamics, the theories of Einstein, as applied to the motion of the planets. We have various paradigms which have formed the basis of these theories, like the paradigms of uniform motion versus the absolute motion versus relative motion, paradigms of symmetry, paradigms of conservation, paradigms of equivalence. And all of these ideas help us to look a little further into nature. But no one of these ideas seems to describe all the phenomena. So coming into this situation in 1970 as a physicist looking at the situation of the world, and the problem of the diminishing of resources and the consumption of the oil, I said to myself, there is no answer in conventional science for our energy problem. So, and I was agreed with by all the other great minds at the time. So I said to myself, well, there must be some way of looking at the facts that we already know through a different way, a different paradigm. And that might help us to do a different experiment, which will lead to knowledge. Now, one of the 